All right. So we'll uh, we'll pick back up kind of where we ended the other day, and then we'll get in um, a little bit more about hybridization and then how that all applies to OCHEM because we're going to really kind of shift our frame of reference from the way we talk about this stuff in Gen Chem. All right, so when we, this should all be review, right? And we have this set up of um, uh, electron configuration here. We know that L atoms in general and systems tend to be more stable when all of the valence shells are either empty or full. I guess that's, that's kind of a misnomer. You can't have an empty valence shell because then the valence shell is one lower when your valence shells are all full, right? So the easiest way to apply that to, um, to these systems is just as a way to predict what, what charge something will have when it's most stable, right? So we had something like fluorine, its electron configuration is gonna look like this. Um, and we can, we can look at it and say, okay, well, in the second energy level, there is no d orbital. So there's only a 2s and a 2p. We need to get to a total of eight valence electrons to fill that two p orbital. So we need to gain one extra electron, right? All review. So we'd expect that fluorine is going to be most stable. We gain one electron. So as a fluoride ion with a negative one charge. And fluorine is also one of those examples. It's, it's a prime example of why we frequently write one minus instead of minus one. You can see how it's minus one. It'd be really easy for that to look like it's just part of the F. Mm -hmm. um, so one minus is a lot easier to make sure that you're not mixed up there. Um, and we know what the, what the computer science term is when your font starts running into each other. Call oh, that. Uh, I knew the term, but I don't. Oh, kerning. Kerning, yep. K E R N. <laughs> um, kerning is when you might wind up with characters running into each other. And kerning is also a really good example. The word kerning is a good example because we're running into each other. <laughs> into each other. <laughs> uh, I don't know if that's actually where the term comes from, but <laughs> it's a good example right there. Um, and charges tend to do that, superscripts tend to do that, right? Because they're smaller. All right. Um, working it backwards, we don't have a, a periodic table up here, but what if you had something that had this electron configuration? So one S, the one, N equals one is full, N equals two is full. So we're on the third row of the periodic table, right? That has seven electrons. So which column is it going to be in? Of course, so 17. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so it would be fluorine. Fluorine. 100, right underneath fluorine, right? Electron configuration looks almost identical to the neutral fluorine from the one before it. It's just got one more energy level. So that's all pretty straightforward. I mean, we're going to leave behind this way of thinking about electrons when we start getting to hybridization anyway. But this is just sort of lay the groundwork, make sure we're all starting from the same playing field and the same language. Yeah, that coffee is not nearly as good as the coffee that I made myself this morning. <laughs> it's the trouble with getting making yourself really good coffees. You can't get good coffee anywhere else. Yeah. Um, it's a it's a burden. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so ground those non structures. Here's the there's the slide ripped right out of uh, Gen Chem, probably Gen Chem one. We first did this, right? We add a procedure, count your total valence electrons, figure out what goes in the middle, place the remaining atoms, and then move your electrons so that everything has a full valence. The, the key criteria are for they kind of listed in order of importance. Um, if you did everything right on the Lewis stock structure, what has to be true? The Lewis electronegative is in the middle, right? Is the first opposite, is least, the least electronegative. Least electronegative. Yeah. So, like, usually carbon. So, and that's actually like the third level of importance. The most yeah, important right, is that yeah. you get the right number of electrons. 
problems, right? Just, no, we're not creating matter out of nothing here, right? <laughs> yeah. So most important is you get the right number of electrons. And if you have the right number of electrons, the next most important thing is everything has a full valence. And then if every if there's more than one way that everything can have a full valence, you want to make sure that the formal charge is as close to zero as possible, which usually means you put your least electronegative element in the middle. Yeah. Um, so for something like CO2, we won't do all of these examples. We have CO2. We have two oxygens, and each oxygen brings six valence electrons, and you've got one carbon that brings four valence electrons. So we get a total of 16 valence electrons. And we're going to start by putting carbon in the middle because it's less electronegative than oxygen. That's usually a good, a good bet. And it kind of makes sense from a conceptual point of view too, right? Electronegativity is how, how much they, they will share. Something that's really electronegative doesn't share well. So why would you put it in the middle where you're forcing it to share more? Um, and there are cases where you can make something like this um, and it'll actually spontaneously rearrange to put the carbon in the middle yeah. because so that's, that's like not so stable. that's like not stable. <laughs> So if we start by, we know what this one looks like more or less, right? So I'm not going to go through the whole process. Oxygen's got eight electrons. Carbon's got eight electrons. So right number of electrons, 16 electrons total. Bingo. Everything's got a whole valence. There's our second criteria. Third criteria is what allows us to distinguish between these. And that's keep the formal charge as low as possible. Do you remember how to do formal charge? So it was like, it was like a little formula, wasn't it? It was like total valence minus. It, yeah, you're on the right track. It's basically compare how many electrons it quote unquote owns mm -hmm. in this structure. Oh, it's pairs to pairs. the periodic table. Exactly. Oh, okay. So these lone pairs, the carbon it owns it outright. Mm -hmm. But the bond electrons that are in bonds are shared between the two, so they only count for half as many. So in this case, the carbon has four electrons in bonds, so that only counts for two electrons. And then it's got four electrons that it owns outright, so this, it owns six electrons. If it owns six electrons, and it has four electrons on the periodic table, valence electrons, that's got a minus two charge. It has two more electrons than it would on the periodic table. Compare that to the oxygen over here. It's got the same electron set up, so it still has six electrons that it owns, and which matches what, how many valence electrons it has on the periodic table. Means it's got a formal charge of zero. How many does that oxygen own? Four. Four and six for oxygen on the periodic table. So it would be plus two. Plus two. If you do your formal charges right, they should which makes sense, right? Because really all we're doing this is really just a way of assigning which electrons go where. If you counted your electrons at the beginning and you did your formal charge right. It should add up the right number, same number. So compare that to this top one. This one's still zero. Now this oxygen matches it. So it should also be zero, right? And now the carbon in the middle has four electrons, which again matches the periodic table. So if we have a set up here, if we have it set up like this, everything has formal charge zero, which makes it more stable. Um, and it's not really formal charge is really just an abstraction. It's not real, a real thing. Um, it's more that it's a way of seeing if we put the right electrons with, or if we if we put the least electronegative elements in the middle, frankly. Um, if you do that, you'll want your you will wind up with your formal charge being as close to zero as possible. 
Um, so it's really just a way to double check that. And now that we've done that, we're basically going to stop doing Lewis stop structures that way and, and shift our frame of reference. It's one more, one more point here. How about C2H6? There's a reason that one's useful to think about. So C2H6, how many electrons, valence electrons do we have to work with there? So six times. Four electrons. So fourteen. Did we have two? Side what goes in the middle? Can we have? Can we have this? <laughs> no, not loud. Really? Why not? Um, because the carbon out there and like how the electrons kind of like interact with each other, like they just can't keep that shape. If I will like rearrange. So there are some some weird geometries. If you if you yeah. think back to that that Mesford lab that you did in Gentown. One of the, the bonus questions at the end was, well, what if you had seven electron groups? So you can have seven electron groups. It's been observed, but you're never going to see it with carbon. Yeah. And the main thing is it's actually your number of, or your space in the, in that energy level. In the second energy level, you're never going to have more than eight electrons around anything that's in the second row of the periodic table. If you remember going back to to Gen Chem, when you the only time we broke the octet rule was when you got to the third row of the periodic table or beyond. You need a d orbital in order to be able to do something like this. So carbon doesn't have a d orbital. Most of the elements we're going to deal with in OCHEM don't have a d orbital. So the octet rule is more of a hard rule. Um, that's the only time we break the octet rule in this class are the few times when we get something like fluorine or sulfur involved. Um, those are really the only elements that show up in OCHEM that could that can break the octet rule. And they're we're not even going to use them very often. So with that in mind, we're not going to, to set it up like this. So our only other option is we have the carbon set up equally. And really, it's kind of, we're going to kind of think the carbons as being, both of them as being center atoms, right? So when we get to these larger formulas, we don't have just a single center atom when it comes to assigning molecular and, and uh, uh, electron geometries. Each of these carbons is going to have its own molecular geometry. So think back to your best for geometries. What's the geometry going to be for these? Tetrahedral. Tetrahedral. So when something only has two electron groups, it's linear, right? If it has three electron groups, you get that trigonal planar. And those were the easy ones before we had to get into three dimensions. Tetrahedral is the biggest geometry we're going to deal with in this class, other than those weird cases with sulfur or chlorine. Um, because we're going to be dealing almost exclusively with things in the second row of the periodic table, which means we're dealing almost exclusively with things that max out at tetrahedral geometry. They max out at four electron groups. All right, so let's talk a little bit about changing our frame of reference when it comes to formal charge. We didn't assign formal charge for that, um, but that's okay. If, but so here's our way we're going to think about formal charge and Lewis dot structures for OCHEM. If we assume that everything is neutral, unless otherwise specified, which we know that things tend to be more stable when they're neutral, right? And we assume that every atom has a full valence, unless otherwise specified, because again, we know that that's how things are most stable, right? In 
on Earth in under normal circumstances, things will tend to have a full valence and be neutral. We can actually make some assumption. If we have, if we make these assumptions, what do we know about something like carbon? Do we actually need to assign formal charge by counting electrons? When we go back to that uh, CO2 example, the second, when we assigned formal charge, <clears throat> excuse me, for the oxygens and the carbons here, we said, okay, well, the oxygen has a full valence and it has two bonds, it's got to have a formal charge of zero, right? So basically in OCHEM, we're going to stop assigning formal charge by actually counting lone pairs. Um, and we can basically do it just by counting bonds. And oxygen with two bonds has a formal charge of zero because we're going to assume it's also got those two lone pairs to go with it. And a carbon with four bonds is neutral. Because if a carbon has four bonds, it automatically has no lone pairs. Because we're assuming that it's got a formal, that it, it's um, got a full valence in no, and it maxes out at a total of eight electrons, right? So anytime you see a carbon with four bonds, charge of zero. Anytime an oxygen has two bonds, charge of zero. So those are going to be our most common cases, right? Because usually these atoms are going to be most stable when they're neutral. So let's look at nitrogen. Let's see, there's three cases. We'll draw the lone pairs for this one. Which of these nitrogens has a formal charge of zero? First one. Why? I'm trying to think. I think nitrogen's supposed to be at is it three. It has five valence electrons on the periodic table, and so this this setup right here it still owns five electrons, right? Three from the bonds, and then one pair that it owns outright. I say owns as though these atoms have a con concept of property ownership <laughs> and things like that. But obviously, that's just a good analogy for us to think about this. You can own half of something or all of something. Um, and means it makes for a good language for discussing this. What would the formal charge be on this nitrogen? Minus one. Minus one. It's got an extra pair of an extra electron, right? One fewer bond than one. And now we just have a positive. It'd be a plus one, yeah. right? So basically, in, in OCHEM, instead of counting the individual electrons, once we get the hang of this, we're only going to look at how many bonds something has. We're going to stop drawing lone pairs pretty quickly, um, unless we're showing mechanism, reaction mechanisms, and showing individual electrons moving around. Um, we can look at a structure. For, uh, for the, this nitrogen here, would it be safe to look at it as like those three bonds are two electrons each, which is two by three is six, and it has two of its eight all together, making it generally stable? And so it's got the full valence. That only works with hydrogen, right? That thought process, because hydrogen only has the um, valence. So you, you would just look at the that so the hydrogens yeah are only going to ever have one bond because hydrogens only need one pair of electrons to fill that energy bond. Um, the nitrogen counting how many electrons does it need to have a full valence that works no matter what's on the other side of these bonds. Three bonds and one lone pair means nitrogen has a total of eight valence electrons of which it owns five of them. So it has a formal charge of zero, regardless of what's on the other side. Interesting, okay. So if I flip that around, 
we'll look, let's draw another molecule. So that nitrogen, if it's neutral, it has a lone pair there because it's got already got three bonds, right? If if we draw it with a positive charge, then it's implied that there's an extra hydrogen on there. And usually we would actually draw the hydrogen on there. But if you see a nitrogen with four bonds, it's got to have a plus charge because it's sharing more than it normally wants to. You see a carbon, carbon's a little bit weird because it doesn't have that lone pair associated. So we'll, we'll talk more about carbon in a minute, but it doesn't matter what's on the other side of the bonds. It's really just about counting bonds versus lone pairs. And if you see something, an atom that has less than four bonds drawn, then you can assume it has the right number of hydrogens and lone pairs to make it neutral. We'll get more practice with that. We're going to start with, um, we're going to start by drawing complete structures, meaning we're going to show all of the bonds. And then pretty quickly, we're going to stop drawing hydrogens because as you start getting the larger and larger molecules, even something, you know, glucose isn't that big of a molecule. It just gets cluttered. But it just gets cluttered and you start, it takes a lot of time to draw 12 hydrogens um, for, for every molecule. So this is a, a table that is in, I'm not sure if it's in the open state where I got this one. This is from one of my other textbooks. But either way, carbon, when they're neutral, carbons will generally form four bonds. Nitrogens will generally form three bonds. Oxygens will generally form two bonds. Hydrogens and halogens will generally form one bond. And that means when we say generally, it means if there's an exception, we're going to have to provide more information. If it's a nitrogen with only two bonds, we're going to draw a negative sign. On it. If it's an oxygen with three bonds, we're going to draw a plus sign on that oxygen. So you can wind up with things like acetate. So back in Gen Chem, you memorized acetate as one of your polyatomic ions, but we didn't really talk about the structure of it. In fact, usually everybody memorizes it as C2H3O2 with the minus charge, right? <clears throat> That's good enough to say what, what it is, figure out that it's acetate, but this is a lot more detail as to what's going on, right? It's not just that it's the whole thing has negative charge. Really, it's one of those oxygens that has a negative charge. And it's implied, even though we don't draw them out, that it's got enough electrons to fill its valence, which is what gives it that negative charge. It's got three lone pairs around it as well. So it owns seven electrons and it would have six on the periodic table. <clears throat> so, and that's the way that we would, we draw that to make sure that we're being clear is if we just, if you just see an oxygen like that with no charge drawn, we're going to generally assume that there's enough hydrogens to balance it out. It's got bonds, but a lot of times we'll stop drawing the hydrogens and it'll just be implied. So that, and that's how you get structures like, we're drawing the skeletal structure here, meaning drawing none of the hydrogens. Any atom that's not, where you're not specifying what that atom is, is assumed to be a carbon. So this is the same molecule as the acetic acid right here, just in skeletal structure, we don't draw the hydrogens. So with the top molecule 
Could you assume that that's acetic acid instead of acetate? If I don't show the charge, yeah. Right. So if I draw the charge here, then I wouldn't have the hydrogen there. And we would still show the negative charge here. Gotcha. So those are the same. Two different ways of drawing the same molecule. And a lot of times what we'll do in this class is we kind of mix and match our styles of drawing. I'll draw part of the molecule as a skeletal structure. If it's the part of the molecule that's not really doing anything. And the, but the act when we consider the active part of the molecule, I might draw in more detail where we actually care about the individual hydrogens or a lone pair or a charge or something like that. Um, we'll get more practice with the different styles of drawing these out. We have a lot of good um, practice problems with that. And we already talked about this. One. What must be true if a nitrogen has four bonds? It was. It's got to have a plus. You can't have any invisible lone pairs on there, right? Because nitrogen's in the second row of the periodic table. Second row of the periodic table will never have more than eight electrons, period. And what I always remind everybody is there's no faster way to put your instructor or TA in a bad mood um, in an OCHEM class than to draw a nitrogen with five bonds <laughs> or a carbon with five bonds. Nothing on the second row of the periodic table will ever have five bonds or more than eight electrons, right? That, and you know, I think all of you have had me as an instructor this one. I don't like absolutes. I very rarely use absolutes, but this is one. Never, never, never will you have. <laughs> even that, even that. <laughs> there are some cases, I'm sure, but they're going to be super high energy. We're talking like cosmic rays in, in deep space. Never on Earth. In, yeah, never on Earth <laughs> will you have. Qualifier. <laughs> thank you. Um, will you have <laughs> nitrogen with five bonds? Like halogens could, like I have five, like that sort of stuff. Right, but not the fluorine. Only the iodine. Okay. Yeah. So when you get to the third row of the periodic table and you've got that empty d orbital to play with, that's when you can break the octet rule. Nothing for the second row of the periodic table will ever have more than eight. And nothing from the first row of the periodic table will have more than two. There's only two elements, right? And one of them is helium, which doesn't really do anything. But so hydrogen will never have more than two electrons, never more than one bond. Nothing on the second row will ever have anything more than four bonds or eight electrons. And then it gets funky once the orbitals get involved, but that's beyond this class, so you don't need to worry about it too much. All right, we went through that. So let's practice doing formal charges just to, if the charge is not shown, we can still count bonds and lone pairs to figure out what the charge on the overall molecule must be. So this is just basically going backwards from the way we used to do it when we were drawing the Lewis dot structures. I try to do this up in every periodic table. You grab a periodic table. Let's do this up here. Um, <laughs> we should, I should grab some and keep some up here that we can pass out since they're we're not allowed to have. Um, to put anything on the wall that, that marks this specifically as a chemistry classroom. Um, Do they can have them at California? <laughs> they're not technically supposed to have that either. <laughs> but I would say that, that a periodic table should go in every classroom. So it's not really marking it as a chemistry classroom, just a classroom. But they didn't like that argument. Once you get these written down, I'll throw up a periodic table in case in case people don't have one handy. Yeah. 
And I did not plan it this way. The, the wording on this, I just grabbed this problem from one of my textbooks. Um, it says identify any formal charges, it means any formal charge that's not zero. We're making that assumption that unless it's otherwise specified, everything has a charge of zero, which makes sense, right? That's kind of what we've always done um, in, in chemistry. So in this case, hydrogen's easy. It's a little bit tricky. There are three possible formal charges for hydrogen, right? Because you can have hydrogen with no electrons, it's going to have a plus charge, right? Just a proton, like acid based chemistry. If you have hydrogen with a lone pair, what charge is that going to have? Minus one. It's got two electrons that it owns outright. So you can have hydrogen with a negative charge, we call it hydride. Doesn't matter, I indicates a negative charge, right? So you can have hydride, you can have a hyd hydrogen ion. If you have hydrogen with one bond, though, it's going to be neutral always. Right? So these ones are all good. In fact, if you have hydrogen as part of a larger structure, it kind of by definition is going to be neutral because it can't be attached with fewer than one bond. You have to have one bond and you can't have any more than one bond. So any hydrogen that's part of the molecule will always be formal charge zero. So what does that make the, the aluminum here? How many electrons does it have? Does it own? It's got a full valence. It's got owns four. But it owns four. Has three. And has three. <clears throat> Excuse me. On the periodic table, which gives it an overall negative one charge. How about the oxygen here? Oxygen with three bonds. That's one extra bond compared to normal, right? Minus two or minus one. So it's got it's sharing more than it has extra bonds. But the same number of electrons, it's got a positive charge. Yeah. The way to think about it is, is electrons are negative, right? It's sharing more than it wants to. So it's missing electrons. And again, the hydrogens are all zeros. Nitrogen with two bonds. How many bonds does a neutral nitrogen have? How many bonds? Three. Three. And it's only got two bonds, so it's got extra electrons. So nitrogen with two bonds is going to be minus one. How about the carbon here? Three bonds instead of four bonds with a lone pair. So I have the charge is negative one. Negative one. So this is what in, in organic chemistry we call a carbanion. So it's the opposite of a carbocation, like we talked about in lab. Carbocation is a carbon that's missing a pair of electrons. So this is where carbon is a little bit trickier than the others because a carbon with three bonds could be a plus one or a minus one. If it's got three bonds and a lone pair, it's a carbanion, it's a negative one charge. If it's three bonds, but missing a lone pair, it's a carbocation. Because in this case, it actually doesn't have a full valence. A carbon with a positive charge doesn't have a full valence. That's gonna be one of the few cases where we actually don't have a full valence is those carbocations, which is tricky because they're gonna show up a lot. They're one of the most common intermediates in these different reactions we're going to talk about um, because carbon's not very electronegative, right? So if you put it with a bunch of stuff that's more electronegative, there are some times where something rips electrons off the of carbon and you get a carbocation like this. And in this case, a carbocation um, is carbon with three bonds without the lone pair. 
So carbon is the only one you really have to worry about that too much because everything else is more electronegative than carbon. And so we can usually assume there's, I can't think of a reaction in anywhere in this three quarter series where a nitrogen has an incomplete valence or an oxygen has an incomplete. That's not true. There are a couple where the oxygen has, is a free radical. Um, where it has seven elect valence electrons instead of eight. And they're really unstable, but they're also really useful reactions um, as far as a lot of uh, the earliest plastics that were made industrially were made by these free radical mechanisms where you take peroxide and shine UV light on it and you can get it to split into oxygen radicals, which then go off and are super unstable and immediately wrap, you know, um, rob a nearby carbon of an electron. All right, anything have a formal charge other than zero here? The oxygen. The oxygen. Carbon's good, right? Four bonds. Oxygen's got three bonds, so just like up there, plus one. All right, it'll take a little bit of getting used to, and there will be times when you're drawing these structures and you'll draw something with the negative charge and, and you'll really be like, okay, wait, you have to walk yourself back through the logic, which is why we're spending so much time on it. Um, but in general, it's always gonna come down to, does it have right number of bonds to be neutral? Does it have extra bonds? Is it missing bonds? And that's all you really need to figure out positives and negatives. All right, so let's talk a little bit about, let this get out of order. Do those, do that one in a second. Um, we talked about hybrids, we and about how Linus Pauling is a badass and lived in Big Sur. Um, this is actually, this is not his official Nobel Prize um, photograph. This is actually a Rolling Stone article. Rolling Stone did, a, did an article on Linus Pauling. That's how you know <laughs> that you made it as a chemist when Rolling Stone does a feature on you. Um, and this was just his kitten who randomly jumped on his shoulder while the Rolling Stone photographer was trying to take the picture. Um, and it became one of the more, most iconic pictures of him in the uh, Big Sur in the mountains and the coast. Um, and so Aquinas Pauling is the one who, who formalized the idea that covalent bonds form when you have these partially filled orbitals really famous diagram that kind of explains that. If you think about the energy of the system, energy of the systems are most stable when you can get to the minimum amount of energy in that system, right? That's what makes them stable. And if you start with two hydrogen atoms, so let's say a hydrogen with a spin up electron and a hydrogen with a spin down electron, separated by an infinite distance, there's still some attractive force. Just, I mean, has everybody had physics? Yeah. Yes and no? no. Um, even things that are infinitely far apart that have mass are gonna have some very, very slight amount of gravitational attraction to each other. It doesn't matter if there's only two objects with mass in the entire universe, there is a tiny minuscule amount of gravitational attraction and given enough time, those two objects will slam together. You can do the same thing with atoms that have partially filled valences. If you take two hydrogen atoms that each have one valence electron and one vacancy, and you separate them by an infinite amount of distance, this is basically going to asymptotically approach zero. If you actually had an infinite distance, it, there would be um, this would reach zero, this red line. And you can think of the force in diagrams like this, you can think of the force as basically being the slope of the line. So to put it in, in calculus terms, if, the, if this is an asymptote approaching zero as it gets close to infinity, the closer you get to infinity, the shallower the slope is, right? The weaker the force is. But there is still a force dragging these things together. And as you get closer and closer, it gets steeper and steeper. The force gets stronger, just like when you get a magnet close to the fridge, right? You might be able to feel like a slight pull, but then as you get closer and closer, it jumps out of your hands. 
this downhill stretch here is what is pulling these atoms together pretty strongly until you get to a point where the slope is zero. Because what starts happening, we've got a pretty good orbital overlap right here between these two atoms, but there's even more over orbital overlap if we get over here, right? So what's why does the energy start going upward? The center of each other. Yeah. What does? The two atoms. What part of the two atoms? Protons. The pro the nuclei. Because as you push them closer, they just want to go this way. Exactly. So the electrons are want to overlap perfectly with each other and be entirely in the same orbital. But if you start pulling two nuclei too close together, they start repelling each other. And so this point right here is where those two forces are balanced out. There's as close as you can get the two electrons before the two nuclei start pushing each other apart more than the electrons are pulling each other together. And what happens if we actually, well, it looks like this is an asymptote. And if we only look at electromagnetic forces, it is an asymptote. But what happens in the real world if you get these two nuclei close enough to each other? You get helium, yeah, nuclear fusion. So there actually is other place. This diagram is only looking, it's not looking at gravity, it's not looking at strong and weak nuclear forces, it's purely electromagnetic force. The electromagnetic force has these two balancing aspects to it. And then there's other things that also would affect this as well. Um, and so this means that there is some like average bond length between two nuclei. And what what would affect that bond length? What would affect these two forces? The electrons want to be in the same orbital. That's an attractive force. The nuclei are pushing each other away. That's a repulsive force. What could what could change to tweak? those two forces that could make this, it make it reach equilibrium at different points. What causes an attractive force between charged particles? What do you know about charged particles? Positives push away other positives, right? Do all positives push away all other positives equally? No. What can change? Mass. We're ignoring gravity, okay, though. Yeah. Okay. Number of electrons. Number of electrons and number of number protons. protons. If you double the charge in one of these nuclei, you're going to double the repulsive force, right? At the same distance. So, <laughs> sorry, I didn't specify. Yeah, so as we start getting other atoms involved, other, then we have one, we have different energy levels. We're not just looking at 1s electrons. And we have different number of charges in the nuclei. So every combination of um, types of atoms is going to have its own individual bond length that's slightly different. A hydrogen hydrogen bond length is about 0 0.079 nanometers. A um, yeah, a carbon carbon bond length is about 0.14 nanometers. And they all have these these standard bond lengths because they all have those two variables, the energy levels of the electrons and the charges of the nuclei are gonna affect a carbon-hydrogen bond has a different bond length than a carbon-carbon bond, which is different than carbon-oxygen bond. They're all gonna be right about in the same distance. And we don't actually usually do things in nanometers in chemistry because nobody likes dealing with decimals. So a hydrogen-hydrogen bond is 0 0.079 Nine or seven, eight, seven, nine, I think. And a carbon carbon bond length is about 0 0.14. I'm going off of memory on these. I should have prepped these numbers, but I didn't think we'd get into this today. We get the, um, point. <laughs> we get the point. We actually measure them, though. I want you to be familiar with this term in a different unit that takes this and just shifts the decimal over one place. And nanometers tend to the minus nine meters. 10 to the minus 10 meters is called an angstrom. 
the abbreviation is an A with a circle over the top um, for the Swedish chemist who invented this. So it's 1.4 angstroms or 0 0.79 uh, angstroms. I believe that they, they just chose that because it was an even factor of 10 off of a meter, um, but it was still really close to most covalent bonds are right in the ballpark of one angstrom. They're between one angstrom and two angstroms for the most part. Some of the bigger atoms, they might get a little bit longer. Um, and obviously hydrogen to hydrogen is a little bit shorter, but a carbon hydrogen bond is real close to one angstrom. And it's an easy factor of 10 conversion from a meter, which is nice. Um, I'm, and I want to say, occasionally you'll see it in picometers too, which is just 10 to the three times. So instead of saying 0.14 nanometers or 1.4 angstroms, you'll see 140 picometers. But again, that's not as kind to think about. Our, our brains like to work in numbers that are close to one. All right, so all that to say, Linus Pauling was cool. He figured this out before, and then figured out that how does that work? Uh, let me answer your question. Go ahead and say. I was going to say, is there a graph that looks similar to this for carbon to carbon bonds or carbon? Yeah, carbon? It, it, it's, the same? it has the same general shape. It's just where this minimum is, is shifted a little bit. Right, and would it have the same, like, getting close, I guess it would. Closer, it, it's gonna go back up and get above zero faster because you've got more six protons. more protons and six more protons, which means that your factor, your repulsive force is 36 times larger, right? Because if you remember how, how that equation works from physics, it's charge A times charge B and divided by the radius squared. And there's a constant in there somewhere too. Um, so if you double, the, if you multiply one charge by a factor of six and multiply the other charge by a factor of six, that's six times six more repulsion. So, it, but it really just shifts everything over a little bit with the same general shape of the function. And really it's the, this function is really two discrete functions. There's the attractive force between the two electrons um, trying to fill the same orbitals and then the repulsive force and you just add those together. And when you do that, two other mathematical functions. Which is exactly, and I don't actually know that this. Generalizations. Well, we can add these two force equations together. Why can't we add these two orbital functions together? These orbital shapes mixed together um, to get it a hybridized orbital. Um, and so I, I like this. Um, I like these slides partly because, probably mostly because um, part of my job interview and one of my first jobs was uh, was teaching this concept. And so I actually made these figures myself when I was still in grad school um, as a way to explain how constructive interference works. So when we start taking these atomic orbitals, if we start overlapping them, we don't actually get something that looks like two discrete orbitals anymore. We get something that's a mixture of the two. And that's mostly due to constructive interference. So if we start by looking at the atomic orbitals of oxygen and the atomic orbital of hydrogen, when we mix them together, we get something that looks like this. Where the green because any amount of the green over here is basically going to counteract that. You can think of it as up and down as far as um, um, two waves canceling each other out. But again, like we talked about the other day, it's not the same as spin and it's not the same as charge. It's its own sort of variable that we just talked about the phase of the orbital. Um, and so this is what's called a bonding orbital. 
bonding orbital happens when you have more constructive interference than destructive interference, and you end up with an overall more stable system by mixing these two functions together. However, if you can do that the right way, you can, you can picture if we flipped these two phases. If we flip the two phases on this, put the blue here, and the green there, and then brought in a green close to the blue, we actually get destructive interference happening, right? And so if we did something like that, we wind up with, with an orbital that looks like this, where you have um, you know, almost negative overlap. You can't really have negative overlap, but you get something that's less stable than if they were actually an infinite distance apart. We call that an anti-bonding orbital. And so the bonding orbital is the other, the other um, term that we use to describe these is we're talking about a single bond we're, uh, between these and, and the bond is directly between the two nuclei. Then we call that a sigma bond. Do you remember using that term? Did you use that a little bit in Gen Chem? So a sigma bond is when you have a single bond between these. If you have the opposite of a sigma bond, a sigma antibond that looks something like this, we indicate that with, just with an asterisk, a sigma star. Sigma star just means it's, it's the inverse of a sigma bond where you get the destructive interference. So is this happening like deeper in bigger molecules as well as between these two small? Yeah, so this is anytime you've got, a, <clears throat> excuse me, anytime you have a bond forming, it's making both a bonding orbital and an anti-bonding orbital. Because if you think about a 1s electron has a certain energy and another 1s electron has a certain energy, when you bring them close together, they went down in energy, like that, that graph, right? And with a lot of times we don't actually show the, the curve part of it. We just say, okay, well, they're downhill in energy a certain amount because you could become more stable. But if there's a way that you can bring them close together to make them more stable, there's a way you can bring them together wrong. Not wrong, that's implying value judgment, but um, that you can bring them together that's less stable. So if this is our Anti-bonding orbital, symmetrical meaning just as high above the two states. For every amount of energy that you get out of it, you become more stable by making a bonding orbital. The anti-bonding orbital will be a corresponding amount, unstable, if that makes sense. And so if we only have the two electrons from two hydrogens, well, we, there's a possibility of doing this, but we don't actually see it. At their ground state, their most stable state, they're just going to sit here in the bonding orbital. But what happens if we shine the right wavelength of light on this? The energy levels. We can. What do you? What happens to electrons when you shine light on them? They uh, move. They move <laughs> from from where to where? <laughs> Let's see. Me. So let's say we have one S, let's go back to our atomic orbitals. So let's say we have a system like this. If we shine the right wavelength of light, we can get one of these electrons to jump from the 2S to the 2P, right? So, and we, that's what we call the absorption, right? And if it fell back down, it would give off light of the same wavelength, right? We call that fluorescence. Is there anything that says that that can only happen with atomic orbitals, or can we do that with hybridized orbitals as well? Yeah. There's, there's nothing prohibiting that, right? We have to, at its most basic, yeah, we call that 2s and 2p, but it's just really just two different energy levels, right? Energy states. That by shining light on them. So what we get 
wavelength of light, wavelength of light that corresponds to that amount of energy. You can bump an electron from the bonding orbital up to an antibonding orbital, which basically makes the whole thing fly apart. This is why shining high energy light on molecules causes them to break down. If you shine UV light on molecules, you start promoting electrons from bonding orbitals to antibonding orbitals, and the molecule sort of falls apart. This is one of the reasons why UV light is so bad for, you, for our cells, is because you start causing your DNA to literally lose, break some of these covalent bonds that normally hold it together. This is also why DNA is exceptionally stable if you keep it out of sunlight. Like, there's, if you just look purely at the kinetics, how the rate of DNA decomposing naturally with no light shined on it, it lasts forever. The whole Jurassic Park idea of taking DNA out of, um, you know, mosquitoes trapped in amber, DNA does last that long. If you get a couple of samples, then yeah, there'll be some natural degradation. But if you get a couple of samples, odds are you'll be able to get you know, most of that information back because these covalent bonds are super stable until you start shining light on them. Because then you start bumping electrons up to these higher energy levels. All right. Let's take our break. Let's come back at 10 after and we'll talk about what happens before the bonds happen, before you make bonds, you've got to make hybridized orbitals. Then the hybridized orbitals hybridize with each other to make bonds. <laughs> Layers. <laughs> it's like inception. We can go another level deeper. 
All right, thank you for your patience. 30 seconds then. Um, I can't walk across campus these days without somebody needing something from me. <laughs> but we're good problems. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Linus Pauling comes up with this idea. Constructive interference between the orbitals is really what um, what causes these bonds and antibonds to come to form. The problem is, is if we just look at it at this level, it does predict, if we look at the energy levels of, um, or the uh, electron configuration of oxygen, it does an okay job. Because if we look at oxygen, you've got the 1s, the 2s, the 2p, So yeah, we should see oxygen forming two bonds based on this, right? It's got two half-filled orbitals. Each of those half-filled orbitals can overlap with a hydrogen orbital to make one sigma bond. So carbon. That's not carbon. This is oxygen. Oh, sorry. Yeah, you're right. Thank you. I do one more too many. So there's oxygen. So that works pretty well. Uh, part of the issue is one, the experimentalists were able to see um, by this point, x ray crystallography was in its infancy and they were able to start working backwards from, from these x ray diffraction patterns. Say, so, well, these two p orbitals should be 90 degrees from each other, right? The p orbitals all formed along, they all formed along the x, y, and z axis. Of in 3D space. So if this is, if we call this the, the EY and this the PX, these two bonds that form should be 90 degrees to each other, right? This one's formed along the Y axis, this one's formed along the X axis. We know from, from basic geometry, our Cartesian coordinates are 90 degrees from each other. But they actually started seeing these were more like 109 degrees from each other. So that meant something was wrong with this idea that we can just take the atomic orbitals and mix them together. Plus, here's carbon's structure, the one that I tried to draw first. This can predict carbon also can only make two bonds, just like oxygen, because it only has two partially filled orbitals. But that doesn't fill its entire valence shell. So it's actually more advantageous to be able to form more bonds if that's what's going to allow carbon to get to a full energy level, right? I always like this. I mean, this applies to all chemistry stuff because every time you go to another level of chemistry, you learn that what's, what I taught you last year wasn't right. Um, or at least it could be more right. Um, so the idea that Linus, this, and this is what actually won Linus Paul, the, the extension of what won Linus Pauling his Nobel Prize, was that if we take all of these and mix them together, we can make four orbitals that are all the same energy. And if we make four orbitals that are all the same energy, we can follow Hun's rule and line them up so that each one of them is halfway filled. And if each one of them is halfway filled, then that means that we can make four bonds and fill the valence at the same time. That just changes the geometry and the shape, um, which allows us to then start seeing tetrahedral shapes emerge. Okay. Right, and so that process, all of these processes where you're talking about mixing these, these orbitals, overlapping and changing shape, all of those are considered hybridization. Hybridization literally means in, in uh, math and physics that we're mixing different functions together, usually just additively. We're just taking them and we're adding them together. We're letting constructive and destructive interference happen. And what we get out the other side is a hybridized orbital, an sp3 orbital in this case. And then those sp3 orbitals hybridize with another sp3 orbital or with a hydrogen s orbital to make a sigma bond. 
So atomic orbitals hybridize to make sp3, sp2, sp orbitals that are considered molecular orbitals, which then hybridize with the molecular orbitals from the nearby atoms to make bonding and anti-bonding. There's some other examples of more hybridization that happens too when we start talking about um, pi bonds and resonance. But it all comes back to we're starting from these fundamental functions that then mix together to make something that is a little bit more stable, which mixes together to make something a little more stable. We don't get, and really, if we just have an individual atom, there are orbitals stay like this. Our atomic orbitals, our p orbitals, and s orbitals. We're talking about individual atoms in a vacuum, not interacting with anything else. They're a really good model for what the energy levels look like and what the shape of the uh, actual orbitals look like. It's just as soon as you start letting them interact with anything else around them, you get these other levels of hybridization happening where you're mixing together all these different possibilities. The one thing we don't see is that we almost never see any hybridization of core electrons. So core electrons are what are below the valence. You've got the unoccupied orbitals, and then you've got the valence level, and then you've got the core electrons that are lower in energy than that. They're so low in energy, and they're so spatially insulated from the surroundings that they basically just stay the way they are. Um, and we don't have to worry about them. They influence a little bit what's going on at those higher energy levels, but they're typically so well separated that we just ignore them. And that's why we really only look at valence electrons when it comes to hybridization and bonds and charge and, and really all, all of it. The only time you see anything from the four electrons start interacting is if you have a system like this, if you shine really high energy light, you could see, see some of these electrons promoted up temporarily. But there's be, there's such a big difference in energy. It would be one, it'd have to be really, really intense light, not intense, really, really um, high frequency light. And it would almost immediately fall back down. One of the electrons would fall back down and you wind up back to your ground state again because it's so unstable to have those core shells um, incomplete. Would that be considered a hybridized orbital if that was to happen in hydrogen? It'd be it would be considered an excited state orbital. Um, the orbitals, the, the energy levels wouldn't change just because you excited an electron, at least not much. So they wouldn't really hybridize by doing that. The hybridizing comes from the interaction, comes from the interaction to reach a stable state, gotcha. not really from moving from one stable state to another state. The states are all pretty well defined by how many electrons you have and what other atoms are around. All right, let's talk a little bit more about hybridization. What if we don't actually hybridize all of our 2s and 2p? If we're only making three sigma bonds, instead of four sigma bonds, we wind up with one piece of the p orbital that doesn't get mixed in, which means we don't get sp3. Just remember, sp3 is indicating how many pieces of each type of orbital are mixed together in your hybridized orbital. sp3 means one part s and three parts p. If you have one of your p pieces that's not getting mixed in, it's not sp3, it's sp2, right? You, you only have, and the, the exponents here, we use the exponents, they're not really exponents as far as mathematically. We're using those just to indicate how many s pieces and how many p pieces. And so the total number of the exponents should always add up to how many of those sigma bonds are you forming or how many electron groups you have. Put it in Vesper terms. 
And so the reason if we make a, a, a double bond, we don't see as much hybridization because we basically skip that sp3 step. Remember the arrows, you get the atomic orbitals, then sp3, and then molecular orbitals. A pi bond that you get when you have it, um, when you have a double bond forming, you actually need to do that spatially. You have to put that those orbitals around the sigma bond that's already formed. Sigma bond looks like two sp hybridized orbitals on top of each other, overlapping to try and get as much overlap as possible, right? Well, you can't put the second bond in the same space. That volume of space that the sigma bond is taking up has to be, is already taken up. You can't put more electrons there. So to form a second bond in this, between the same two atoms, you have to do it by kind of going around the sigma bond. And you do that by taking two p orbitals and overlapping them on top of each other. And so that's why it's a, it's a different type of bond that forms. We don't, it's called a pi bond versus a sigma bond. Sigma bond is always going to be the single bond. And then if you make another bond on top of that, it's going to look like a pi bond. And when you make a pi bond, because it has to be the two p orbitals overlapping with each other, we don't get to mix them in. So we don't get sp3 hybridization on those carbons. They get the, you get sp2 hybridization with the pi bond around it. What would we expect if we had something like carbon dioxide? So if we have carbon dioxide, that carbon in the middle has two sigma, sigma bonds and two pi bonds, right? One pi bond each direction. So the sigma bond here, it's gonna look like that, right? And where, it's, where it overlaps, you're gonna find is you get that constructive interference, you get a sigma bond forming. And that's gonna be the same on both sides. It's gonna be one over on this side too, right? Then you've got a p, a p orbital on the oxygen and a p orbital on the carbon. In this case, I'm shading to indicate the different phase. These kind of overlap with each other. And these kind of overlap with each other to make a pi bond, right? So this oxygen, well, uh, hang on, we'll talk about the oxygen. We also had a pi bond on this side, right? Let's draw our Lewis dot structure. We had a pi bond the other direction as well, right? That means that this middle carbon has to have two pieces of its p orbital that are not mixed in, right? And it can't be the same space. So it can't be up and down. So where is that other pi bond going to form? Besides, in and out. In and out, yeah. Right, which I'm not an artist, but, but I'll do my best. So now these are overlapping with each other. These are overlapping with each other. So we get another pi bond forming, which means now that there's only one part of the p orbital from that middle carbon that actually was there to, to hybridize, right? So if, if that middle carbon had its 2s, and 2p, but both of these had to form pi bonds. What's the hybridization? What's left to mix together to make those two sigma bonds? 
two, one part S and one part P. So this middle carbon has a hybridization that's just SP. So basically everything that has is in the second row of the periodic table, you can think of it, it's if it's making as many sigma bonds as possible, it's going to be sp3. Because that's what allows all the space to work out as far as arranging things in a tetrahedral shape. Every pi bond that you have, or every empty orbital that you have, is one thing that's not mixed into the sp3. So you can basically take away one of those p orbitals for every pi bond or every empty orbital that you see around an atom. So what does sp3 look like? Because I, I thought this would be sp3. So sp3 would look like methane. Anything tetrahedral is sp3 because you get those four electron groups, one part s, three part p, naturally arrange themselves. All the constructive interference naturally arranges so that you get that tetrahedral 109 degrees apart. And doesn't it also have a sigma bond and three pi bonds? It is. So if you have all sigma bonds, it will be sp3. Okay. You only start seeing pi bonds forming when you need to make double bonds because you don't have enough electrons for that system. So sigma bonds are more stable. You get, you can see how this has a lot more overlap. This overlaps a lot easier because you can literally point those orbitals right towards each other, right? This, we kind of have to like use our imagination and smear them out in order to see a pi bond. Pi bonds aren't nearly as strong, and aren't, aren't nearly as stable as sigma bonds because the orbitals can't overlap as well. So everything's going to, by default, try to make sigma bonds. And if you don't have enough electrons to make sigma bonds for everything, then you start making these pi bonds. Does that make sense? Yeah, so it's the pi bonds that aren't part of that hybridization. Exactly. And, because, and that means that the pi bonds can't be part of that hybridization. So you basically take one p orbital piece away for every pi bond you have. Could you have an S carbon? Um, carbon, that would require making a quadruple bond. Right. And carbons don't really do that. The only quadruple bonds we start seeing are once you get to the d orbitals, because the d orbitals make everything weird. Um, so no, you don't. We're, I can't think of a case where you'd ever have just an S. Really, the only atom that ever will be in a molecule with just S hybridization is hydrogen, because it doesn't have any p orbitals to mix in. Almost anything, everything else is going to be sp something. Just like after pi, like for the triple bonds? Triple so bonds, I think, are like two pi bonds, right? Right. So let's look at carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide's Lewis structure looks like this. So it's going to look a lot like our CO2, except both of those pi bonds are going to be between the same two atoms. So you'll have carbon, oxygen, color scheme the same. Here's our sigma bond. That would still be SP2. It would, the it would, be, it would still be SP. SP. Right. Because then there's the, the triple bond piece. So you get these overlapping in and out. So sigma bond and then two pi bonds, the red pi bond and the green pi bond. But in this case, that's still that carbon is still going to be sp because it's got two two orbitals that are not part of that hybridization. And the other orbital, so really it only has one sigma bond here, right? So where the where's the fourth pair of electrons. How many electron, go back to Vesper geometries, how many electron groups are there around that carbon? How many things are taking up space around that carbon? Uh, two. two. 
just the two, right? Because even though we have to make these pi bonds and we have all these spatial constraints, that all these six electrons are all pointed in the same direction as far as angles go. They're all pointed to the right. The other thing that's taking up space is an electron lone pair the other direction. That's your other hybridized orbital. So this overall has an electron geometry that's linear. Lone pair points that direction. The sigma bond and both pi bonds point to the right, and they're 180 degrees from each other. What is the hybridization on the oxygen here? The orbitals on the oxygen look the same, right? It's going to have the same thing. It's got its own lone pair taking up space 180 degrees from the sigma bond. But it's still got the same thing, right? So it's got two of its p orbitals are stuck in pi bonds. One of its p, uh, p orbitals can mix with the s orbital to make an sp hybridized orbital that way and an sp hybridized orbital that way. So lone pairs still count when it comes to looking at the hybridized orbitals, right? And that's why, if we go back to CO2, each of these oxygens has its own hybridization as well. So what's the hybridization on carbon? SP, SP just like with carbon monoxide. Oxygen has three things taking up space, three electron groups, right? Which means how many hybridized orbitals do you have to have? Also three, so it's got one part S, two parts P. Yeah. Okay. So the other thing to remember is that hybridization and the those electron geometries from Vesper geometries are like our one-to-one -one translation. SP3 always means tetrahedral electron geometry. SP2 always means trigonal planar electron geometry. SP always means linear electron geometry. And if you have ever had something that wasn't hybridized, it can only ever have one bond, like our hydrogens we talked about, right? Hydrogens, we don't talk about the molecular geometry on hydrogens because they're all it's always the same, right? So can you even call it linear if it's the end of the line? <laughs> right? So it's, 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 it's its own thing. <laughs> it's more philosophical. Right. <laughs> All right, so if you can count electron groups, the, the concept, I want the concept of hybridization, why it works out, why adding these functions together works the way it does. I want that to make sense at a conceptual level. I'm not going to really necessarily make you mix them together yourself um, because what you can always do is count how many electron groups you have. As long as you can get to a Lewis thought structure, you can work out the hybridization by just saying there's three electron groups, it's trigonal planar electron geometry, therefore it's sp2. It does mean that I, if I give you a structure like this, this is a pretty easy way for me to write a quiz question, for instance. What's the hybridization of every carbon atom in here? And all you got to do is count how many electron groups there are, and then make sure your number of hybridized orbitals adds up to that. So that one, it's got four things taking up space, right? So that means it's four electron groups. Therefore, you need four electron or four orbital pieces added together, sp3. This one looks a little bit different because it's got two carbon carbon bonds and two carbon hydrogen bonds, but still it's the same thing. It's, it's the same hybridization taken forward. Exactly. And that's where we get into, like we were talking about before, like, okay, carbon carbon bond has different bond length. The molecular orbital between uh, around this carbon is going to look slightly different. Qualitatively, they're going to look really similar, but they're going to be slightly different energy levels. A carbon 
that's in the middle versus a carbon that's at the end. They're both tetrahedral. They both have the hybridization. The orbitals will look just slightly different. The bond angles won't be perfectly 109 degrees because this carbon takes up more space than these hydrogens do. But qualitatively and within sig figs, they're going to be pretty what identical. Would the orbital geometry change with more and more atoms in the molecule? Is that it does a little bit. It turns turns out to be pretty localized. Really, atoms like atoms more than than one carbon away aren't going to affect the energy levels of these of these hydrogens over here. The the hydrogens that are directly attached to it will, or they're one carbon away, will, and we'll see the effects of having this big object, but mainly just as in terms of size. And you've got some any anything that's this size will have roughly the same impact on those hydrogens. Um, and that's a good question. We start talking about NMR and how the electrical fields of these hydrogens affect other hydrogens. It basically we, we only see them able to interact a couple angstroms away. So we really don't see this hydrogen over here. Is not going to affect, it's not going to couple with the energy levels of that hydrogen over there just because pure distance. Okay, but enough atoms added to one side of it could shift the geometry to where they may affect each other. Right, but mainly just as a collective, just like as a cloud of electrons taking up space, not in terms of the actual energy levels. They're just going to be pushing on it. Right. Yeah, but two of them to the other. Right, exactly. All right, let me clear this. So how about these two? Those things would be SP2. SP2. Oh, it's just SP3. SP3 again. SP1. And also SP. Right, and it, we will continue to use these terms because it's actually a good shorthand for electron geometry because it's a lot easier to say SP2 than trigonal planar every time. It's just purely <laughs> fewer syllables, nothing else. Um, but we, we will, it's a good, also a good way to describe what starts happening in terms of resonance. We'll have certain cases where, like for instance, if we had a nitrogen attached to a benzene ring, so we'll make this the complete structure. Let's see what's going on. There's another hydrogen there. So all of these carbons are sp2, right? They all, every one of these carbons has one pi bond attached to it. That nitrogen has four electron groups around it, the way it's drawn, right? So we would expect it to be sp3 just based on looking at that. But if we actually look at the geometry of this molecule, um, that nitrogen actually behaves like it's sp2. It's flat, it's trigonal planar because that lone pair starts interacting with all these pi bonds and starts behaving like it's part of this conjugated system of pi bonds here. And so hybridization is a really useful way for us to talk about that because we can say things like, well, that, that nitrogen has sp2 character, even though it looks like it's, it should be sp3. Um, and so it's, it's a useful, they're useful terms for us to be able to do that, even though it seems like a little redundant, it is kind of redundant, but it's a way to get around just the geometries to talk about how the electrons themselves are behaving. Um, and then we already have kind of talked about this. We only really have to deal with tetrahedral. We don't really need to look at anything down here unless we're dealing, I guess phosphorus is the other one. Phosphorus, sulfur, and occasion and chlorine will occasionally have geometries down here. Chlorine for most of this class, though, most of them actually are going to be um, they're going to behave mostly like the atoms right above them in the second row. There are a few cases where we'll have a phosphorus or a sulfur that actually breaks the octet rule, 
um, in the reaction. Um, but for the most part, phosphorus is going to have three bonds to be neutral, just like nitrogen does. And you know, sulfur is going to make two bonds to be neutral, just like oxygen does. Um, so for the most part, we're only dealing with tetrahedral and smaller geometries, which means we don't need to worry too much about anything past sp3. If we did, though, what would we have to start mixing? We don't. We can't have sp4. SP3. Right, we because add, we run out of pieces. You add the new uh, orbital or the new energy. That new energy level. That and when you get to the third row of the of the periodic table, there's an empty d orbital that you can start mixing into our hybridized orbitals. So instead of it can't be sp four because there aren't four pieces of a p orbital. So you would have instead sp3 and then you add in a little bit of d orbital to make that fourth that bit the electron group and then if we had six electron groups we have to use two pieces of the d orbital so it'd be sp3 d2 which is the exact reason why you will never see anything in the second row of the periodic table have more than eight electrons there is no d orbital to use if there's no d orbital to use, you can't get past tetrahedral or sp3. I think the way that I teach this really drives home the fact that never, ever, ever do I want to see a nitrogen with five bonds. <laughs> um, because my students are usually pretty good about it. I hear, I see things online and I hear from other OCHEM instructors that man, I just can't get these students to, to wrap their heads around the fact that you will never have a carbon with five bonds, but that's not as big of a deal here at LTCC. And I'll flatter myself to think it's because we spend so much time talking about this. Drill it into our heads. Exactly. Yeah. It should make sense from multiple points of view. Um, oh, there's a, there's a better view of a uh, carbon carbon triple bond. So that's not carbon monoxide, that's CH2. Um, C2H2, so acetylene, is going to look like this. So we're not on Zoom anymore. I clearly wrote this slide when, I, when we were still teaching during COVID. Um, it's not a Zoom poll. When you have multiple bonds formed between two nuclei, would we expect the bond length here to be closer? Are these two carbons going to be closer to each other or further apart from each other? Closer. Why? It's the same amount of protons, but it's got more of a triangular force. Okay. What was your thinking, Jerry? I was thinking that it would be farther apart. And why? Just because of like the bond energies, like a lot, like smaller. So you're they are closer. But your thinking is not wrong, right? Yeah. Um, you're, because it is all about how we don't have um, as much pulling these together. But that actually means that the orbitals, in order to make those pi bonds, you actually need to get them closer together because you can't point them directly at each other, right? And so pi bonds, a carbon carbon with a pi bond is going to be a little bit closer together. It would be 1.2 angstroms instead of 1.4 angstroms. And a carbon-carbon triple bond might be 1.1 angstroms instead of 1.2. Um, and it works. You can think about it a couple of different ways. They're more tightly bound to each other. So there's more force to overcome those that proton-proton repulsion. Um, if you had an sp3, then that carbon, those electrons are kind of being pulled equally in all equally different directions, right? As opposed to having them all be jammed together in order to get the orbital overlap. It's slightly counterintuitive that way, but um, good thing to keep in mind, especially when we start talking about infrared spectroscopy, um, because it turns out we shine infrared light on these molecules. Every one of these bonds, every pair of atoms that's bound together, they have this natural vibrational frequency. Um, because these bonds, we draw them like they're a static object, but really 
um, when we have that that the graph here, there's entropy and really just the, the temperature. There's a thermal energy in the system. So when we say, okay, well, that's the bond length, that's the average bond length, but really this thing's you know, rocking back and forth at the bottom here, which means that this bond length is kind of going like this. And so we actually can treat these like every one of these bonds is a spring. And every one of these springs is, has a different coefficient, a different Hooke's law coefficient mm -hmm. for the physics people, where basically you think of that as being how stiff the spring is, which means every different bond will absorb a different wavelength of light to make it vibrate more. So we can actually look at how, if you think back to Gen Chem and doing those, those absorption, um, labs where we, we looked at one wavelength and we looked at how much of it was absorbed when it passed through a sample and we used that to figure out how what the concentration was of something, right? Remember doing that with those beige boxes? Um, a infrared spectroscopy is the same thing except we scan through the entire spectrum of infrared light and we measure how much light gets absorbed at all of these different wavelengths. And we can say a carbon-carbon triple bond absorbs light at this frequency, or an oxygen, a oxygen-hydrogen single bond absorbs light at this frequency. And we just have tables of them. And you say, okay, well, I'm looking at this big, this spectrum that looks like where up and down represents how much absorption or how much light is transmitted. And this is wavelength of light. You can say, okay, well, that peak right there, where that light's being really well absorbed, corresponds to a specific type of bond that must be present in my molecule. Maybe an oxygen, hydrogen, single bond. But then this one right here corresponds to a the same, the right wavelength for a carbon oxygen double bond absorbs at this wavelength. That wavelength is a carbon hydrogen single bond, and that wavelength is a carbon hydrogen um, single bond if it's sp2. If the carbon is sp2, it's a different wavelength. So all of these factors come together to make the overall shape of the molecule and the overall characteristics of the molecule. But we can sort of tease out certain aspects that always behave the same way and use that to put them together to make an overall idea of what molecule this is. That's a part, that's part of one of my favorite things about organic chemistry is the is what they call qualitative analysis, which is here's some information about a molecule. What is it? Um, or what properties does this molecule have based on this measurement? Um, because it really is like a three dimensional crossword puzzle um, where like, OK, well, I get this information from over here and then I can take this reading over here and that gives me the across piece to my up and down. Um, and you can start to figure out what these molecules are. All right, let's end there for today. Hybridization, I think that the only, um, we will do quiz this weekend. Um, do, do by midnight on Sunday. I believe it's just going to be a question, or at least I'll make it, it's going to be a question like this. I give you a molecule, label, label some hybridization. It won't be all carbons, though. I'll throw in some oxygens and nitrogens to, um, to mess with you a little bit. But don't worry about that. Remember how I said that like, the nitrogen had the lone pair that behaved like it was SP2? Don't worry about that for today. Okay, so it's just like the general, the general, the general, what does it look like based on how many electron groups are drawn? You okay. said that was due to presence? It is, yeah, so basically you, if you if you put a bunch of pi bonds or unhybridized p orbitals next to each other, then you can spread out the electrons in a larger space, which is usually more stable. And so by making those lone pair, that lone pair behave like an unhybridized p orbital, it gives the electrons that are part of the benzene ring more space to spread out, basically. Um, and that makes the overall molecule more stable. So it's like the benzene ring is being so big, it's like affecting that.
<laughs> There's a whole chapter on resonance, and we'll do we'll spend a whole bunch of time talking about resonance. So I don't want to get too much into it right now. Um, but yeah, that's where it's where we're headed. All right. Any questions? Cool. Then have a good weekend.